saved a touchdown, most likely. There goes Garner to the 40, to the 30, breaks a tackle at the 20, 10, 5, unbelievable! Touchdown! And welcome back to another episode of the Cool Your Jets podcast. We're your host, Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Michael, Adam Gase did say before the season that the Jets will be playing meaningful football in December. And as you and I both know, this next stretch of five games, it will certainly be the most meaningful stretch of football that the Jets have played in the last decade. Five weeks ago before landing Trevor Lawrence, arguably the greatest college quarterback prospect ever. Michael, how are you feeling? Are you nervous? Or are you are you calm with how terrible the Jets played on Sunday? You know, do you think there's any chance that they they can blow this and end up not picking first overall? Just how you feeling, man? I'm definitely feeling a little nervous, but overall, I, I feel really good about the future of this team. And I think if you've been following any of the tweets I've been, uh, been putting out recently, especially on Monday, there, there's just a lot to be excited about with this team. And if they can cap it off and get Trevor Lawrence, it, it, it's just going to be the icing on the cake to a season that, despite the record, I mean, the Jets have de- are developing a lot of really exciting young talent. And Joe Douglas is showing you, uh, giving you a lot of reasons to believe he is the, the general manager that can turn this team around. So I, I'm excited, but at the same time, uh, all these positive developments can get in the way uh, of the Jets potentially uh, finishing the job and getting Trevor Lawrence. The Jaguars are right there making this really annoying and frustrating uh, with their consistent losing as well. So hopefully Gardner Minshew can come back and uh, save us some stress, but I, I feel really good about where this team is going, which is very, it seems crazy to say, considering the record consistent blowout losses. But I mean, when you just look below the surface and see what they've been cultivating here on the roster, there's, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic, but it's right. going to be a really stressful last five games because just one win is all it takes. And this could all be blown away. So uh, I'm optimistic, but definitely nervous. It's going to, it's going to be a really, uh, stressful month of December watching these games. Yeah, you, you refer to Trevor Lawrence as the icing on the cake. And I'll put it, and while icing is certainly the most important part of the cake, I mean, you, you can argue that, but certainly the most flavorful part of the cake. Uh, if the Jets don't land Trevor Lawrence, there's no cake to be had, if, if we're being completely honest. This season will be, for the most part, in vain. And look, J- Justin Fields is a, is a terrific quarterback prospect. And any other year, he'd be the number one pick. And, and if the Jets, do end up picking number two. I'm sure I can talk myself into a quarterback prospect like that, but somebody like Lawrence is just, there's such a certainty and look, there's never a safe pick in the NFL draft, but there's just so many elite traits that he possesses. He's unlike any other rookie quarterback. We'll, we will have ever seen Justin Herbert has been the best rookie quarterback ever up until this point. And I think Trevor Lawrence will break all of his records next year, regardless of what team he's on. And yeah, you, I mean, we've been talking about this for, for weeks that the average NFL fan, We'll look at the Jets and think that they're a dumpster fire and that Trevor Lawrence should avoid them. But any sort of nuanced fan or hell, this this applies to the head coaching search as well. Uh, Any head coaching candidates, people say, stay away from the Jets. And there's certainly an argument to be had about ownership and whatnot. But from a roster perspective, and when you look at even general manager Joe Douglas, you look at what he's done in his first draft. You look at the fact that they have an elite 22 year old left tackle who's probably going to a Pro Bowl this year. Quinn Williams is going to be a Pro Bowler this year. Denzel Mims is playing out of his mind the last few weeks. Doesn't have a touchdown, but he's just displaying in the first, I think he's played five games at this point. Yeah. Crazy athleticism and athleticism. I don't think I've ever seen from a Jets wide receiver. Um, Health will be a, you know, a big thing for him. Obviously he pulled both of his hamstrings in training camp, but the way he's been playing, I have very, very high expectations for him. Um, So I'm feeling really good. Like you, I, I, I agree. I think that, as long as they can keep on this path of it's the ideal and it's five weeks is such a long time, but it's the ideal path of they're so bad that they're going to lose and they're not going to win a single game. But you're seeing guys like Quinn and Williams, like Mekhi Becton, like Denzel Mims, hell, even guys like Bryce Hall and Ashton David, those guys are starting to make plays. They're getting valuable reps. It's just, you don't hope they play too, you know, too good that they win a stupid game against the Raiders or against the Patriots and cost themselves a guy like Trevor Lawrence. But yeah. And to talk about the value of Lawrence, like if they fall number two and get fields, like that's a very good consolation prize. Like you said, he's a great prospect would probably be number one any other year, but Lawrence is just at another level and it's not just getting him. It's about everything he brings uh, with him to the organization, how much more attractive the job becomes. If you go into the off season, knowing that you have the ability to draft him 
uh, for free agents, how much more attractive it becomes to go and play with him. It changes everything to get him. And as good as Fields is, he's just not quite at the level to where he brings that same uh, aura and respect to the team. So there's a lot more than just getting Lawrence. And look, he's obviously what he brings on the field matters a lot. And this is why he brings all these other things. But uh, it's it's all of those things that help turn around a team that is on track to win zero games. Uh, the things that a franchise like that needs to turn around, right. he brings to the table with uh, yeah. a position, the free agent. So it's it's really important for them to be able to snag him. They, it, it's not the end of the world if they don't, because again, Fields is great. There are a lot of positive developments on the roster. Yeah, that we'll, we'll certainly sell it as the round. Yeah, but, we'll, we'll but to go, but to, but to be this bad and not be rewarded, uh, they're doing it. They're doing this in a season where they're fortunate, fortunate enough that Lawrence is there to be had. This isn't uh, like the one drafter Eric Fisher was the topic, or you know, one of those years where there isn't really a worthy reward. Trevor Lawrence is out there, so this is the right season to be this bad. So it would be awful to be this bad and not be rewarded with him. Uh, but not the end of the world if they don't get him. But it's it's really important to uh, this can be an extreme one of the best seasons in terms of long-term impact in Jets history, if they can f- continue developing the way they have been and finish it with Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, I've seen a lot of, and we go back to the casual NFL fan, and I don't want, know why I'm giving them any sort of attention, but I've seen the argument that, well, Trevor Lawrence isn't going to fix it all by himself. And, and my response to that would be, well, we'll do a pretty damn good job of it because like you said, it's not just about getting an elite quarterback prospect because Justin Fields is that as well. Trevor Lawrence is more refined, but it's talking about you're changing the narrative of the team. You're attracting better head coaching prospects, which is the most important part out outside of Lawrence, I guess I would say about this off season. You could maybe even argue more so as the head coach is the most important part of a football team. You can see it that I actually, I feel like the Jaguars are less talented than the jets. I feel like the jets are more talented than quite a few other teams, but they're so poorly coached that they're not going to win a game this year. They at least and shouldn't win a game this year and quarterbacks as well. We could talk about that in just a minute. Um, but yeah, you bring in Trevor Lawrence, you get an elite quarterback prospect. You're going to bring in an elite head coaching prospect. Um, and you're going to change the aura around the team. You're going to be able to attract better free agents. It's a big deal for the jets. And I know we've been saying this, we've literally been saying this since what we two at this point, it's been more or less the same podcast, just talking jets and, and a lot of Trevor Lawrence praise, but the, the closer we get to this, the more my hope rises And the more my anxiety rises about it, because all it takes is just one game. It's easier to say in September, like, well, if they go on 16, we'll take Trevor Lawrence. But now that it's actually becoming a reality um, and the Jags and Jets are just neck and neck. um, I mean, I don't even allow myself to watch Trevor Lawrence highlights. I'm not going to let the Jets get my hopes up just to just to crush them. But especially with Trevor Lawrence pretty much confirming um, on Saturday that this is his last season as he, you know, he's pretty much already done that, but saying it was his senior night and whatnot. I mean, this this is it. He's going to come out this year. I think he knows that the Jets are – look, he's not going into an amazing team. The Jets are far from that. But as far as where you can end up as a number one pick as a quarterback, pretty damn you know good uh, situation. I mean, you look at what Joe Burrow ended up with in Cincinnati. You know, Cincinnati, Ohio, no indoor practice facility, terrible O-line, questionable management and coaching. And then you look at the Jets and it's like – questionable ownership for sure um but i really love the management the direction management has been heading in the last year and a half um we don't know about the coach but presumably a new hot head coaching candidate um and you're in the the world's biggest market and and if you win in new york city if you win a super bowl for the new york jets i mean you're gonna make more money than than patrick mahomes uh, as far as your nfl contract and then everything that will come alongside with it you'll be a, a a superstar and trevor lawrence is used to that he's been a star since high school but it will take his level of fame and popularity and marketability up tremendously um but michael you, you mentioned something poor quarterbacking and we we got sam Darnold back after a few weeks off with the the ac joint sprain it's been an injury riddled season for sam Darnold, um and his worst season as a pro and, and a season that me and you both thought he was going to jump out uh, you did write a hundred reasons to believe in Sam Darnold. I, yep. <laughs> I think, I think we've, we've run out of about 99 of them so far. Um, there's a small glimmer of hope that he could turn it around. I shouldn't even say small. I think that, I think he will turn it around somewhere else. I think he just needs a fresh start, better coaching. Um, but I don't think he's going to hit the ceiling that we thought he was going to hit. What were your thoughts for, uh, about Sam Darnold's performance on Sunday? Was it as bad as, as you're making it sound? Yeah, I, I think it definitely has reached a point with Darnold where, 
Um, with the Jets, I mean, like you said, he goes somewhere else. Maybe he turns it around. He's only 23 years old. And this is a league where we've seen teams have done are, are figuring out how to do a good job supplementing their quarterback. Jets aren't one of them, at least at this point. But um, he could definitely turn it around somewhere else. But with the Jets, the way he's played the season, I mean, he's got seven games. He's missed four games over two separate stints. So the durability this season has been a problem. And when he's played, he's had seven games, and he hasn't had a single productive game, hasn't thrown for two touchdowns in a game, hasn't, has only thrown for 200 yards in two of them, and one of them he needed garbage time to get there. Four straight games without a touchdown pass, and it, the support excuse isn't there anymore. There were plays in this Bills game. There was one where Jameson Crowder was wide Dolphins. open for a Dolphins. touchdown. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Dolphins game. I completely losing my mind at this point in the season <laughs> but there was the one play uh with crowder i think i think anybody would be i think anybody would be losing their minds if they they cover the scene like you do writing an article every single day about arguably that's one true of the worst so i guess i do deserve history. some slack but but there were there are plays the offensive line this game looked even with elf line and connor mcdermott starting it was pretty solid there were a lot of clean pockets he just didn't make plays from the two interceptions he threw were just throws you cannot even think about trying. Uh, and they're the same mistakes he's been making his whole career. Uh, so th- this season, he's definitely been the worst starting quarterback in the league. Qualified starting quarterback. Obviously, he's better than backups, guys who've come in as emergency starters or whatever, rookies. But in terms of guys who are their team's you know, number one starting quarterback came into the year, he's been the worst by a wide margin and a lot of the numbers he's been putting up, whether it's his pass rating yards per attempt, net yards per attempt, first down percentage are compared to league average on pace to be some of the worst we've ever seen from a quarterback uh, against the league average in that season. So uh, it's, it's been disappointing. I really thought he was going to have a big season this year, uh, but it, it, I don't know what has happened and you can blame coaching all you want. And of course they have played a big part in it, but, uh, he just has new weaknesses he didn't have. I mean, he struggled with his deep accuracy, the turnovers, mechanics, things like that. But he, over his first two years, didn't miss wide open reads as often as he has been this season. But in, in so many games this year, you look at the Colts game, Denver game, uh, this one especially against Miami, the Bills game uh, in his first return in week seven, Those games in particular, so many open throws that he's just not seeing, not confident enough to try. Uh, His his confidence, his field vision, his ability to process things post snap just has fallen off a cliff. After you know already needing improvement for him to hit that ceiling, Uh, he he's really things that were weaknesses have become worse. Things that weren't weaknesses are now weaknesses. So it's whatever has happened has happened. But at this point, his chances of being the franchise quarterback here are as about as low as you can be without it being zero. But uh, yeah, at this point, it doesn't seem like there's too much hope for him uh, in terms of being the franchise quarterback here for the jets. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sad to watch for, for Sam because he's been nothing but um, respectable and humble and, and easy guy to root for. Um, but yeah, it's not just coaching and talent at this point. I mean, he's just playing bad. And, and part of that might just be, you know, some guys play worse than they really are. And I think Sam has, has been that this season. I don't know how much the injury is affecting him, but I really think it's just a change of scenery uh, will do him wonders. I'm not saying that he's going to become a top 10 quarterback, but you put him in San Francisco with Kyle Shanahan. And I think you're going to have, uh, you know, more of the guy that we saw last year towards the, the middle part of last year. Than the guy that we've seen this year, it's not like Sam Donald's been bad since day one. He's had plenty of high points. It's just his, his stock market is crashing. And I think Adam Gase is, is the primary cause about this, that the jets just completely ruined Sam Darnold. It's, it's terrible to say, but they did. And, and the reason is Adam Gase. And so when people say the jets are going to ruin Trevor Lawrence, well, Adam Gase isn't going to be here. And, and I, uh, I don't want to say this, but no matter who they hire, I don't really feel like they can screw up the hire as, as much as Adam Gase, knock on wood. Um, I don't really feel like they can – They can. We'll be ready for Matt Patricia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bill O'Brien. Um, so I don't really feel like the Jets ruined – even though I just said the Jets ruined him. They hired Adam Gase, so it's their fault. But it's Adam Gase that ruined Sam Darnold. His complex schemes, he didn't mold it 
to Sam Darnold, his teaching. Sam Darnold has gotten objectively worse the more he's been under Adam Gase. And, and Ryan Tannehill is the perfect case study for a guy who has left the Adam Gase system and, and been good. But the thing to remember with Ryan Tannehill is he was never this bad. Right. So it, yeah. it's concerning w- w- with Darnold. How much do you think he's hurting his, his trade value um, by playing this poorly? Because I think at the beginning of the year, Jets fans said after we were 0-3, it's like, well, we can trade Darnold for a one and then get Trevor Lawrence. And then it's, it's become more of a two. I think Dan Orlovsky, or maybe it's Daniel Jeremiah, keeps holding on to the fact that, oh, he still thinks the Jets can get a one. I've been more set on a two. I think that a two is probably above what he's worth as a player, but when you look at the situation under Adam Gase, 23-year-old quarterback, was the best quarterback in the 2018 draft, people are going to think they can fix it. There's a lot of teams that kind of need this type of quarterback, that they're not bad enough to get a top rookie quarterback, and they're not good enough to, where they have a, a long-term quarterback. Um, so teams like Chicago teams, like San Francisco. Um, so he makes sense for a lot of teams. So I thought a bidding war probably end up in a two, but now it's getting to the point where he's being so bad. It's like, is that three too high for Sam Darnold? I mean, what do you think his, his price is falling to uh, the ideal scenario? I, I would much rather the Jets just go on 16 and get the number one pick in Trevor Lawrence. And the Jets can only trade Sam Darnold for a three or four than obviously than Sam Darnold playing well enough where he can, we can maybe get a one for him or a two for him. Uh, and but they only get Justin Fields. I want to get Trevor Lawrence, and I'll do it whatever cost. But what are your thoughts on on Sam Darnold play affecting his trade value? Yeah, I, and and I do agree with you in the fact that you know I would you know you like his trade value to be better, but from a rooting perspective, I don't think it's worth you know him playing better just to increase the trade value and you know potentially risking the tank. So from that perspective, I don't think it's something you know the first priority is getting the number one pick, but. In terms of his trade value, it, it, I mean, he's definitely pushing it as, about as low as he possibly could with the way he's been playing. But I do think there is, uh, I think there's a floor, you know, for a player like him. Only 23 years old, was the third overall pick a couple years ago, and has the easy excuse of Adam Gase that a lot of teams will look at and be like, okay, get him out of there. We saw Ryan Tannehill did, although it is a completely different situation. Much older quarterback who was, frankly, much better for the Dolphins than Darnold has been for the Jets and was never this bad, as you said, but so much different situation, but a lot of teams will, you know, look at Tannehill and just look at Gase and what he's been doing and think, okay, we can fix this guy. He's young. He's obviously really talented. Even if the, you know, performance hasn't been there physically talented, just has a lot to uh, mentally and mechanically to fix. But I think a lot of teams will look at him and think, believe in their own ability to develop him. So as bad as he plays, no matter how bad he plays, I think there's probably a defined floor around that third round range that I don't think he's going to go lower than just because the value of the quarterback position, we see how, how, how big of how much value teams place on it uh, in the league today, how many quarterbacks rise, fly into the first round of the draft, uh, what they get paid when they do, when their deals, when it does come time for them to get paid. So teams have a huge premium on the quarterback position. They don't, Team, there are very few teams in the league that don't have a defined solution at a given time. Everyone's making investments. They want to be able to find their solution. And I think Sam Darnold is a guy you can look at as a, a really good wild card to take a chance on. So I think no matter how bad he plays, a third round pick is probably as low as he can go. I, I mean, Josh Rosen had an atrocious rookie season, and it is different because he was a rookie. Darnold has three years in the books now, but Rosen got a two and a five after a very bad rookie season. And, you know, he's validated that not even, you know, really struggling in Miami and not even playing this season. So he got a two and five and Adam Schefter in a report, which was after the Broncos game in week four mentioned that as a comparison, a package that uh, GMs around the league seem to think he'll get. And that was a while ago. Darnold has had a lot more bad games since then. But I think a third round pick is probably that would be my guess that he would get a third round pick. I don't I think a four is too low. And again, he's playing really bad. So, I mean, maybe he does go that low. But I I think for a a quarterback who is a recent top three pick and is still younger or about the same age as a lot of guys who are either getting drafted or are rookies. I think teams are going to want to buy into that. So I, I think third round is probably my guess right now. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think there's still a chance that he could he could go for a second. That's been my the general consensus in my head is that he, he will go for a two. 
I think you're right. I think he's playing so poorly that he's going to fall to a three. I think it'll be a three and then a four next year or something like that. I think that it'll be some sort of package or maybe a three this year and a five next year. I, I don't think he'll just get a three. I think a package of picks makes sense unless it's going to be a two. Um, but he's, yeah, he's certainly going to have a market. Um, but moving on from the quarterbacks, cause that's all we've talked about to, to open up this podcast. Let's talk about a guy who's been really exciting the last few weeks. We, we mentioned a little bit Denzel Mims. Uh, I asked you last week, you know, your thoughts on how he's been playing, what type of, what type of receivers the Jets look to pair him with uh, next off season. But this week, yeah, I, I want to know what you've seen from him uh, the last few games. He had two incredibly athletic plays that didn't end up counting both in the end zone. Give us your scouting report on Denzel Mims. And then also, we, me and you were talking about this beforehand, because I'd said, you know, I don't think I can recall the Jets ever having a receiver this athletic. And then I thought, well, how many NFL receivers in history have been this athletic? And not just athletic, but had the same level of skill. Because Denzel Mims has a, a trait that is very hard to teach. And we talked about it after they drafted him. It's that last minute separation. It's that ability to separate when the ball is in the air. If you notice most of his catches, he's pretty much draped by a corner. So he's still working on the route running uh, ability of, of creating three to five yards of separation before the ball is thrown. And, and the good news there is that that's something that you can definitely get better at. That's something that a year three or a year four Denzel Mims may be very good at, but right now he's winning with his speed and his athleticism. And then it's that last it's that I think it's mainly instinct, but it's also technique. Um, that last minute ability to separate to high point to track a ball and bring it down. Um, he's displaying all of those things. Uh, what's a player comparison in the NFL and talk about who that might be and why you're feeling so high on Denzel Mims, because obviously Makai Becton has been outstanding this year. We think we have a pro bowler with him, but maybe explain to our listeners why the Jets might have another pro bowler, another future pro bowler, I should say in Denzel Mims. Well, I'm going to seal this. I'm not going to claim this comparison. You told uh, you brought it up before we started recording this. Joe Blewett has said it as well. Um, but AJ Green, I think, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I just love what Denzel Mims has done so far. From a numbers perspective, there's so much to like. He's third among rookies in yards per route run. He's fourth in receiving yards per game. And he's only the eighth receiver ever to start his career with at least 40 yards uh, in his first five career games. So the consistency he's had playing in this offense with two of the worst quarterbacks in the league, probably the worst play caller, uh, or play callers, whoever is calling the plays, who even knows at this <laughs> point in the league. Um, guys, it's not hard. It's not hard, guys. I mean, <laughs> we, we've talked about this. Yeah, I, I call I call some third down plays. Two minutes, I, I'm just taking it? on third down. I want to call it third down. <laughs> I, I love the inquisition that, that uh, Rich Samini and Connor Hughes put on uh, Adam Gase, by the way. And, and it's only going to get worse over the next few weeks because it doesn't seem like he's going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, it, it's going to be entertaining for sure. A, a good a good finale to send him off with but but with Denzel Mims considering <laughs> all the obstacles for I'd, I'd like a classic not to cut you off but I'd like a classic Geno Smith I can and Polly situation between Rich Samini and uh, Adam Gase I would just love some of that I mean no, I don't want anybody to get seriously hurt but I'm just saying you know some some drama maybe some fist thrown uh didn't that just it happen through zoom the, though it's through zoom it's through <laughs> well, okay maybe Adam Gase will just end the zoom and then send him a mean emoji <laughs> That would be great. There definitely needs to be something like that. But back to Mims. Consistency in this offense with all the obstacles. So impressive. But um, to talk about what you were um, bringing up with what he does at the catch point, it's just this subtle ability to, once the ball's in the air, uh, to, to be able to use his hands, defeat the hands of the defender, swat them away, swipe them away, uh, rip his arm under, whatever he needs to do, the subtle movements to free himself up to be able to go up and play the ball and he does such a good job of attacking it with his hands he doesn't let it come into his body obviously he made the one mistake in that bills game his debut which he did that once but for the most part you look at his baylor career and what he's done with the jets so far he attacks that ball midair has great hands is able to i think that's the thing that really separates and there are a lot of receivers you know specifically for the jets who haven't had a ton of good receivers who catch with their body don't attack the ball but he has great length. He goes up, times it well, and high points it and uses his strong hands to make a lot of great uh, acrobatic catches. And, I mean, the, athlete, the Roth athleticism is there in terms of vertical leaping ability, the speed. Uh, he just has a lot to work with. And like you said, separation, that needs to improve. You don't want to make – you won't, you don't want every single one of your catches to be a jump ball. You want to get those catches where, you know, teams play off you and give you free catches because they respect your ability to beat them deep. 
You want to shake defenders off you and make easy catches so they press you up, then you can win deep. You want to have the all-around game going, and he does have the ability to do that. We've seen it, seen moments this season, and, you know, the raw physicality, you know, physical ability uh, with the quickness of his feet. He can be a great route runner. Just has a lot of, you know, subtle things with his technique to clean up before he can get there. But to be producing the way he's producing with, you know, still not even having that part of his game rounded out is so impressive. And that's what gives him the, the ability to be great. He still has such a long way to go with creating separation. He's really not open that often, but he's still open when he's not open because he can deliver in pretty much any situation. So, and the blocking too is a tremendous bonus that he adds. Um, so I love what Denzel Mims has done and considering what he's been doing in his, you know, coming in mid season was dealing with injuries, barely practiced, no preseason come right in to this terrible offense and be, you know, producing like over a third of the teams, about a third of the team's passing yards, right. uh, which is second among rookies behind Justin Jefferson, is incredible. And I, I definitely think he has a good chance to, you know, a- at least be a very good number two. But the the potential is definitely there for him to be a, a very good number one receiver for them. Yeah, and what a draft class that would be for, for Joe Douglas if he could land a Pro Bowl left tackle and a number one, a legit number one wide receiver in his first two picks um, as GM of the Jets. And I said this to Michael, and of course you want J- Joe to hit on rounds three to seven, hit, you know, he's not going to hit on every pick, but at least find some some studs there because that's really where the Jets have lacked. But even if Joe Douglas were to just hit on his first and second round picks, you know, for the next, for every year he's a GM over the next two years, that's six picks. So for his three years as a GM for the jets, he would find eight absolute studs just to put it in perspective, the lack of talent, this team is missing. The jets have missed, missed on far too many um, first, second, and obviously those, those three to sevens, but just the, the influx of talent that Joe Douglas has the ability to add into this team is, is exciting. And I'm looking forward to seeing Mims as, as a red zone target, because I thought that was something um, at Baylor that, that I thought he did display the Jets haven't really had much of an opportunity to show it but that last minute ball in the air separation is, is going to be you know key on those fade routes when you're on the two yard line that's something Brandon Marshall was very good at for the Jets but we just haven't gotten an opportunity to see that from Denzel Mims and I think the AJ Green comparison is, is actually very accurate obviously Green was seen at the time as, as the best receiver in the class it was between him and Julio Jones and they were both high first round draft picks Mims was considered at times to be a first round draft pick. He fell into the second, fell in towards the end of the second into the Jets' lap, thankfully. Um, but I just think that his athletic profile matches AJ Green and, and what he's able to do uh, to track that ball at the last minute and create that physicality without getting uh, a pass interference call. Uh, I think that the con there, when you see with a lot of these explosive athletes, especially the thinner guys like, like Denzel Mims, is the injuries. He made a, an amazing catch. Uh, his first catch of the day actually against Miami on Sunday. And then he was hurt and had to come out for a few plays. And and then, and then even he caught a 30 yard pass or he caught, you know, a 10 yard pass and took it 20 extra yards or whatever. Uh, But he didn't even look like he was running. It looked like he was still hurt. So there's, there's always going to be a concern with Denzel Mims. I think about anytime you just have those explosive athletes, the soft tissues, the hamstrings, worrying about the ankle, there's always, but I'm not saying it's a certainty, but there's the, the fear is that there will kind of be some lingering stuff with him, but boy oh boy that is the talent evident uh and and i'm really excited to have a guy like that on the jets because michael i don't think we we've ever had anybody like that and you know i'm not saying he's randy moss but he certainly displays a lot of randy moss type of of athletic traits when that ball's in the air um just an absolute um specimen that the jets have a a wide receiver really excited about him and hell brasad perriman's playing playing pretty well too i i don't think he should be a starter next year but i'm definitely down to resign him and and have him as receiver four given the injuries that the Jets will inevitably face next year, he will presumably play a a good amount of of football and and more NFL teams are are moving towards some 10 personnel. So he'll certainly get, even if people aren't injured, he'll certainly get his chance to shine. So I'd love to bring back Perriman because he's really come on over the last few weeks. Um, Let's talk about the defense really quickly before we go to a few mailbag questions, then we'll get out of here. Quinn Williams. I think he deserves some praise from us because um, before the season and look, he's one of those guys. And I feel like, uh, you know, I've run a Jets podcast for four years, I think now, 
five years. And there's always guys like Quentin Williams who it's, I really hope he can take this next step, this breakout season. Can he do it? And I'm pretty sure every other guy, it's been a no, including Sam Darnold. It's always been the hope is greater than the still reality. Still waiting for Lorenzo Malden. I'm still waiting for the Lorenzo Malden breakout uh, in addition to what maybe the Derek Jones. Well, that's that's a little, that's a bit, bit of a stretch. Who are some other, who are some other great? Um, Stephen Hill. Stephen Hill. That's, that's a good one. Um, Evan Smith. Yeah, Devin Smith. Hell, I mean, Leonard Williams, who's having his breakout this year, um, was always a good player, but it was always, is he going to take that next step? And he never really did. He's, he's fair play to him. I think he has six sacks this year, so he's certainly playing at a much higher level this year. Um, but back to Quinn and Williams. And I'll be honest, before the season, I'm, I'm, you know, somebody can go pull up the records. I'm not sure exactly what I said, um, but I don't know if I really believed it. I, don't, I, I think he – I thought he looked really good in, in his training. I thought his body was completely – transformed and i knew that it took you know he's 21 he had one year of starting experience at alabama it generally takes defensive linemen and this applies to jabari zuniga as well who hasn't really done much generally takes defensive linemen about a year sometimes two years to really make any sort of presence felt um so i I knew all those things i think it's just generally i'm a pretty optimistic jets fan but the every year i cheer for the team and and certainly this year will have added some um some wounds to, to my optimism I get a little bit more pessimistic, a little bit more, well, he's not going to do that. And I got to give Quentin Williams credit because he has succeeded every expectation uh, that I had. And I think my ceiling, my ideal ceiling, you know, ceiling for a Quentin Williams second year season outside of being immediately Aaron Donald. Uh, And you could make the argument that on Sunday, he was Aaron Donald. I mean, he was virtually unblockable. Michael, talk about the the growth and the development in Quentin Williams. You noted it in his rookie year. He had plenty of flashes, but as you and I both know, Hell, look at Sam Darnold. Flashes don't mean that they're a great player. It's the difference between a good player and a great player. And it seems that Quinnen's really made the jump from a good to great. Is there anything Greg Williams is doing in his scheme, the way he's using him, or is it just that Quinnen's just gotten a lot more comfortable in the NFL game to be producing like he like he's been producing and not being the invisible number ninety five that we saw a little bit of, uh, or I, I shouldn't say a little bit more of um, his rookie year. I think he's definitely just bringing uh, bringing everything together here in his second season because from a scheme perspective they're still running I mean they still have a bad edge rush that isn't you know uh, forcing quarterbacks to step up into him for production they still have a bad secondary that's allowing quarterbacks to get the ball out earlier and they're still running a lot of stunts but he's producing on those stunts by just flat out destroying people uh, there were there was play in this Miami game and a similar one in the previous game against the Chargers where you know, all he's supposed to be doing is crashing down on a stun to open it, open up room for somebody else, but he's just wrecking people and finding ways to get into the backfield and create damage. So uh, he's just taken a, a, a big step up this season. He has, uh, I mean, the technique was a big part of his game at Alabama, not just, you know, the physical tools, the strength and the explosion, things like that, but he showed you so many, you know, moves in his, his toolbox with the Crimson Tide, you know, as a pass rusher, and in the run game. And, and now we're seeing it here in the NFL. We didn't see too much of it last year. He mostly relied on his power to win, but we're seeing his rip move as a consistent weapon. Uh, we're seeing him, you know, just win in a lot of different ways. He's getting off the ball a lot more explosively and violently. Uh, and, and he's just doing a really good job this season in both phases. And I definitely believed in his breakout this season. I don't know if I thought he'd be this good because so far he's been a top five interior D lineman. He has a com- combined 54 pressures, stops, and pass deflections this season. Uh, stops are tackles that, uh, you know, they constitute a bad play by the offense, so like a short game that's not a first down. So combined 54 of those three things, that's tied for fourth among interior D linemen, tied with Chris Jones and Cameron Hayward behind Grady Jarrett, Stephon Tuitt, and, of course, Aaron Donald. So that's fantastic company. He's been a top five producer at the position this season. And he's only getting better. He set a career high with seven pressures against the Chargers. Did that again against the Dolphins with seven more. Uh, so he's in both. And, and in the run game, he's been maybe the best all season in terms of his numbers. Creating run stuffs have been pretty much number one throughout the season. He's number one in total stops among interior D linemen with 28 of those. And his pressure production in the passing game is now up to a top 10 to 15 level. Um, he's 13th in pressures right now. And again, he's only getting better. So he's just been fantastic this season. 
Uh, I definitely thought he's going to take that step this year because there were a lot of flashes last season. And, you know, it reminded me of Jamal Adams. In his rookie season, he wasn't necessarily a good player. And as a rookie, he made a lot of mistakes. But there were flashes where you could see he was very close to making a play, just an inch away from a pass breakup, from an interception, from a sack, things like that. And then he made up that small bit of ground in his second season and became a, a superstar player over his last two seasons with the Jets. And that's what Quinton Williams has done. There were a lot of near sacks last season, uh, plays where he was, you know, if he just got off the ball a little bit quicker, he could have created more pressure, blown up the play a little bit more. Um, and he's made up that couple, the couple of inches this season that he's missing last year. So in both phases, he's been absolutely dominant this season and one of the best defensive tackles in the game. So really great to see this pick panning out for them, especially with trading Leonard Williams. You lost a big impact interior guy. So they need someone to, well, they needed him to make up that void and he's doing it. So this is, is working out really well for them. Yeah. And the other thing to remember when you talk about him last year was he had that ankle injury and that was right. a lot, yep. a, the ankle sprains or something that, that linger um, throughout the season. And I think that's something important to remember with a guy like LaMichael Pirine. Uh, in addition to a few other guys, but he's the big one that comes to mind because he had that gruesome ankle injury in the green and white scrimmage, according to B reporters, either to be carted off. A lot of people thought it was going to be a, a fracture. Maybe a season was going to be over and it just turned out to be a severe sprain. He was out for a few weeks, then he returned. Uh, and now he's out again with the ankle sprain. I, I assume the same ankle. And it's just a thing to remember that, you know, I've complained about P Ryan's inability to break some tackles, but you're not always getting a player at its, at its full strength. We don't know if Piran's just been fighting through this lingering injury the entire season, and that could be part of the reason why he's not breaking as many tackles as he did in college or whatnot. I'm not saying that now he's next year is going to be Josh Jacobs or anything, um, but just an important thing to remember when you're, especially when you don't have a, a huge sample size for a young player, you can't just judge. It's part of the reason you can't just judge a young player off of one year. You need two or three years. You need as many, you know, as big of body of work as you you know, can feasibly get to judge how they are, how often are they healthy, what's their average level of performance. And we're clearly seeing that Quinn and Williams uh, is a different player this year than last year. And even go back to, you know, when you talk about the importance of his position, go back to week one, because I feel like it, it did take him, a, he didn't really break out until week two, I felt. I felt like week one, he was relatively quiet. And if you remember watching that game, it seemed like Josh Allen had like 12 seconds to throw in the pocket. I mean, he was just dancing around and there was zero pass rush. And I remember just being, wow, this may be the worst Jets pass rush I've ever seen. I mean, they can't even touch him. And now you see what they're doing with Quinn and Williams and the interior pressure. And that the fact that you said that they have no edge talent for the most part. I mean, we like Bryce Huff, but he's not at this point in his career. He shouldn't be starting. Jordan Jenkins is a high motor player, but he's no... Um, Bud Dupree or, or any of the top edge rushers. I love a Bud Dupree was the guy who immediately came to my mind. Von Miller. I don't know. Yeah. You know, any of those top guys uh, he's not one of those guys. He's, he's a five to eight sack player a year. And most of them are cleanup sacks, but you look at the value of interior pressure in today's NFL and Williams, Quinton Williams is, is the number one example of it. I mean, you look at week one when they weren't getting any sort of push, Quinton was relatively quiet. And now you look at today Quentin Williams is playing virtually every snap. And you look at the push that he's creating in the pocket. Every single play fits, not every single play, but for the most part, the Jets were getting after Ryan Fitzpatrick. And it's not because of the talent that they have. It's because of Quentin Williams up the middle, destroying the interior defensive linemen, which frees up other opportunities for guys like Jordan Jenkins and guys like John Franklin Myers. The point being, if the Jets can get one, probably two edge rushers over the next year or two, to, to build around Quinnen in that front seven, they're going to be a problem. That, that role that Quinnen plays is so valuable. And the fact that he's doing this with no edge talent around him is super impressive. You see teams are double teaming Quinnen Williams and he's getting through them. And that's a tremendous, you know, tremendously positive sign in only his second year. I'm very excited about the development of Quinnen Williams. And, and when the Jets do, I shouldn't say when, because the Jets haven't had an edge rusher pretty much since I've been watching them. Um, if they can get some edge talent around him, their pass rush is going to be deadly because they already have arguably the most important part, which is that interior pressure. Obviously the edge rushers are sexy, but if you can get a guy like Quinnen who can establish consistent interior pressure, those edge rushers are going to come screaming and it makes their job easier. And your defense as a whole is going to be a lot better. So really excited about the development of Quinnen Williams and he's still super young and has, has room to grow. Um, so just really excited about him last piece about defense before we go do a few mailbag questions then we'll get out of here 
Ashton Davis, Bryce Hall, two, two uh, rookies playing for the Jets uh, on Sunday. They, they've played together the last few, uh, last three weeks, I believe. Uh, Michael, what have been your thoughts? Uh, uh, those two guys in the secondary obviously hasn't been perfect. They've, they've certainly both taken their lumps, but they've also both flashed. Um, just talk about them together. And then you, you can start with Davis, then talk about Hall. Um, do you think those are Joe Douglas draft hits? Do you think these are guys that should contribute next year? What should their role be? How should Joe Douglas plan the roster and the secondary? Can you pencil in Ashton Davis as a starter? Can you pencil in Bryce Hall at this point as a starter? Just your overall opinion uh, on the two rookies in the secondary. I think, like you said, it, it, it's always too early. You know, we're only a couple games in with both of these guys. You don't want to jump to conclusions too no, early. I'm going to go completely back in my own word. Uh, okay. Yeah, I want, I want a complete evaluation after three games. Yeah, I, I think Hall is going to be – the only question with Hall is what his bust in Canton is going to look like because, <laughs> I mean, he's a really handsome guy. But, Whoa. like, okay. I think he he's definitely deserves to be in Canton. It's just where they're going to put it, what it's going to look like. And the same thing for Davis, but – no, seriously. I mean, I, I like both of these guys, what they've done so far. Ashton Davis against the Dolphins. He he did give up the touchdown to Gesicki um, on the on the fade route, or it was a corner route, I think, actually. But he slipped and gave that up. But, I, I mean, it's good to get these reps early on as a rookie. Just And that's why playing time is valuable. Make mistakes. Make them now so you can learn from them. Uh, and not just because the Jets are bad, but still, just for a young player, to make these mistakes earlier in, in your career – so you can learn from them uh, and be able to develop as you go through your career is important. So you're not making these mistakes in year two, year three. That's why it's important to get the playing time now. But he was good other than that. He didn't give up any first down catches besides the touchdown, had some good tackles in the run game. So uh, Davis does seem to be – I already think he's better than I expected. I thought he was going to really struggle based on at least what he showed on his film, a guy who had a lot of upside but might need some time to develop. I think he's already been better than I thought. Not that he's been good necessarily, but uh, for a, a rookie, a third round pick, I definitely think he's shown, he definitely has some potential. The, the versatility they use uh, use him with is impressive. There was one play where he blitzed off the edge. Uh, I mean, didn't even blitz. He was just an outside linebacker and rushed against the tight end uh, against Miami. And he threw a little spin move and beat him to create some pressure. So, you know, he's a really interesting skill set. And then Bryce Hall, I'm, I'm really impressed with what he's shown so far. He did get beat a few times by Devontae Parker against Miami. But again, this is a rookie in his second start against Devontae Parker, one of the better receivers in the league. And, you know, he had a lot of targets against him. I believe he gave up four first downs to Parker, five if you include a pass interference penalty. But a lot of them were really close, really close targets. This isn't like when Pierre Desir is playing, just I'm going to line up 10 yards off. Here's your catch. Do whatever you want against me. I'm mean, Bryce Hall has has been right there in these first two games against really uh, first two starts against really good competition with first Chargers, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, and now Parker at the Dolphins. So uh, even though the production in this game against the Dolphins wasn't great, he was right there in a lot of those throws, and he just his instincts, technique, all look really good. Uh, there's one sack by Quinn and Williams in which Hall, you know, broke on – Fitzpatrick tried to get the ball out quickly on a slant. Hall read it, broke on it, shut it down. That bought time for Quinnen to get the sack. Uh, so there, there have been plays like that that have been impressive. He had another pass breakup in this game, uh, another tightly uh, contested force and completion on Parker. So I like what Bryce Hall has shown so far. I For him – and another guy who, you know, like Mims, didn't get to practice a lot, thrown in in the middle of the season in a not favorable situation – where there's not a lot of talent around him and is looking like he belongs. So Bryce Hall so far, I'm, I'm really impressed with what he's shown. I'm, I'm definitely higher on Hall than Davis, um, but both guys have shown a lot to like. And, and we'll see what happens in the next five games in terms of offseason plans, whether or not you can you know, pencil those guys in, if, they're, if that position should be needs, uh, if that position should be a need, whether it's safety or corner. Um, I mean, corner definitely is going to be a need because, you know, right. even if Hall is the best corner in the league, the next few games, you got a spot opposite him that needs to be filled for sure. Uh, but safety, then it'll be interesting uh, what they do with May and Davis because Marcus May is playing. I think he's been playing really good since he's moved back to free safety. So those two guys look very compatible next to each other. So I would be in support of re-signing May uh, and making those two guys, him and Davis, the duo for the near future. 
But at cornerback, you definitely have a second position to fill there, even if Hall plays continues playing really well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they're going to have to do something at corner, probably a free agent and a draft pick. Um, and that's and then you give Bless and Hall an opportunity to, to battle for that other starting job just because there's so many other so many other holes in the team. If you were to rank the rookie and you look, they need three years to actually know how they're going to be. But so far, I thought I thought you walked back on that. We're, we're oh, sorry. OK, wait, I, their entire I'm walking right now. OK, I'm walking back on my my backtrack. Are you following? Okay, can okay. you write this down? We're gonna have to. <laughs> I'm moving too fast. Put for a you. guide here. If you're gonna time. rank the Jets rookies at this point, um, obviously Becton and Mims. I, I'd say if you, let's do it in tiers. Becton and Mims, I think you can say. Well, Becton's probably in tier one by himself, but let's throw him and Mims in there as far as guys that I'm pretty s- certain are gonna be blue chip prospects for the Jets. Then, then there's that second tier, and that includes Man. You could probably throw Hall, P. Ryan, and and Davis in there as guys that. We don't know how if they're going to be long-term starters, but they at least seem like they can play in the league. They might at worst be backups on this team. And then after that, there's Zuniga, Morgan, and Clark in my mind. Um, and uh, I didn't really go in order there as much. But uh, as far as guys who we really haven't seen at all, we saw a little bit of Zuniga. We have no idea what they can be. They can be complete, absolute, you know, Jeremy Clark, Dylan Donahue level of bums, or they could be able to play in this league. Um, so, what are your thoughts on on how you how you shuffle joe douglas's first draft class obviously we know the first two picks he absolutely nailed what are your thoughts on on the other uh set of picks and and how they they fit into the jets future i mean i think i'd probably put you know just to talk about the first two picks anyway i th- I'd probably put becton in the first tier himself as a very likely top 10 starter I, I, the ceiling's unlimited but i think you know he's shown you he's already a top 10 starter. yeah he probably is already he's gonna go to the pro Bowl. I, you could say he's already a top five left tackle and there's a case we made that in a year or two years will be the best left tackle in all football. Yeah, so he he's definitely in his own tier. Mims can definitely join him, but less less reps on tape for him so far than Becton. And obviously, he's not as much of a touted press uh, prospect as Becton was. But in terms of him, I mean, too early to pencil him in as a great uh, as that he's going to be a great player. But I feel really good about it, so I think he is. Uh, a very likely, at least a good starter, but, you know, unlimited upside. Then after that, you have more question marks because we haven't seen too much of these other players, but we're starting to see a lot of them, which is great. Um, but obviously the complete unknowns are Clark and Morgan. Hopefully they can get Clark in there at some point. I don't know why Elfline is playing instead of him, but Morgan, I mean, it's probably just going to go down as a wasted pick, but I guess we can knock Douglas for that one a little bit. Well, Maybe We still, we still have a preseason. Backup. Hey, but, we're one we're one dominant James Morgan preseason away from from fetching a, that is a true. draft pick from somebody. That's true. So so we'll see. But then Zuniga, still too early for him. I mean, he's played four games and has done pretty much nothing. Has no pressures. He almost he's batted a ball. He almost batted but a ball. He did almost bat a ball. That that. But if that's your best accomplishment, then it pretty much tells you all you need Dylan to know. Donahue. But it is only it has only been four games, and he has only played sixty snaps, which is like less than one game's worth. So he's barely played at all. It's way too early to say anything about him. And then Hall, P. Ryan, and Zoo, uh, Hall, P. Ryan, and Ashton Davis. I probably Hall is the guy I'm most confident in those three. Uh, they're they're all in a similar tier, like you said. It's very early. Haven't seen too much of them, but they they look like NFL players. And you know, in terms of their ceiling, um, I I think you can project that differently. But like they're playing and they're they've been. Okay. I mean, I guess I put P Ryan last out of those three. I mean, like you said, he's probably playing through an injury. I mean, that's the opti- optimistic way to look at it, but he definitely hasn't been very good as a rusher so far Has really, you know, not created much yardage at all, but Ashton Davis is definitely, I think a guy, I, there's definitely a floor there with Ashton Davis. I think, um, you know, that he might not pan out, but the ceiling is definitely exciting with, you know, he has that kind of potential to be a really high impact player with the number of different things he can do. And then Bryce Hall is a guy who I think definitely has starter, good starter upside in him based on what he's shown very early. It's although it is early, um, go watch Robbie Sabo's breakdown on him. Joe Blewett's um, watch those breakdowns and like what he's doing from an instinct, IQ, instincts, IQ fundamental standpoint is really impressive for not just a young guy, but he's blowing out of the water. What guys like Pierre Desir, Austin, any Jets cornerback recently 
has been doing in terms of technique and just the fundamentals of the position. So I'm really confident about He's got to change that number 37, though. Yeah, it is sort of a weird. That's a very preseason type of number. Yeah. That's got to be better. But in 20, terms of, I mean, 27 is an elite corner number, but I think 37. I mean, he could make it look good. Let's, Alvin Kamara made 41 look good on a running yeah. back, but he's he's got to he's got to earn that that 37. Otherwise, you could just switch to some 20s number and look a lot better. Yeah, so the number can be a lot better. But in terms of the coverage and stuff like that, you know, what he gets paid for, pretty good so far. All right, good stuff on the Jets rookies. We actually did end up answering a lot of these mailbag questions, but there's one that I was looking at, and I, I think there is an important discussion to be had. Not necessarily what he asks, but I think it brings up an interesting point, considering we are recording this a day late on Monday night. Something came up during the game on Sunday, and I was I was gone all Sunday, so recording this to come out Tuesday morning. Currently, the Eagles are playing the Seahawks. Um, it's not going well for them. And there's some, some questions being raised about Doug Peterson's job security. We're going to talk about that in a second because, uh, at Ben Thornhill, 199 asks, have your feelings in the Jets head coaching candidates changed any new suggestions? First part of that question. No, I think me and you both agree that Arthur Smith is the best candidate for the Jets. There's two things I do want to talk about kind of on the, any new suggestions parts. Let's start with Doug Peterson, because I want to get your thoughts on this because I think it's a pretty polarizing topic. I, I, let me put it like this. If, if Doug Peterson were to become available, if the Eagles do really fire him after this year, because it's been a pretty nightmarish year in Philadelphia, similar to New York, but they're still alive. I mean, they should even win their division, but you never know what could happen, but they're, they're not looking good under, under Doug Peterson. A lot of regression since Frank Reich has left a lot of fans, an impatient fan base, just like the New York jets are calling for Doug Peterson to be fired. Personally. I don't think that'll happen. I think, Three playoff appearances, a Super Bowl ring. I just don't see it happening. But crazier things have happened in the NFL. Um, you know, you never know his relationship with the owners or with the GM. Um, but I think, I think based off the way this Eagle season is going, I think somebody's going to get fired. And there's a there's a potential that that it could be Doug Peterson. And, and if that were to happen, I mean, I would bet the house that Joe Douglas brings in Doug Peterson. I think. They both know each other. They both like each other. They both respect each other. Doug Peterson would have no problem playing for a Joe Douglas roster or coaching a Joe Douglas roster. And I'm certain that Joe Douglas would have, would love to have a leader like Doug Peterson leading his roster, but there's certainly questions about Doug Peterson as a candidate. First, I'll just start it like this. Would you like this or would you not like it? And do you think there's even a chance that it could happen? uh, uh, Doug Peterson coaching the New York jets in 2021 and beyond. I would not like it. I don't think I'm a fan of this idea. I don't like retreads in general, but I, I mean, look, there are some that make sense, you know, the Andy Reeds of the world, guys like that. But I mean, we're just coming oh, off of one with oh, that. You, you mean it? You mean a head coach from Philly who who went to the Super Bowl, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> there are there is that comparison. <laughs> I'm, I'm that, actually not you know, a huge Doug Peterson. I could already stand. see. I, just... I could already see the beat reporters pointing that out. I mean, the last Eagles head coach that got fired who went to the Super Bowl, he turned out pretty good. <laughs> but, I, I mean, you just look at it, – it's good to whenever you're looking at, you know, whether it's a player or a coach, the opinions of people who actually follow them. And you look at Eagles reporters, fans, you know, even like unbiased, you know, some NFL writers, film analysts out there. Doug Peterson is not a popular guy right now. Pretty much everyone wants him out. They're, this is an Eagles team that's drastically underachieving. And, you know, Carson Wentz is regressing under him. So if we can blame Gase for Darnold regressing under him, we can blame Doug Peterson for Carson Wentz regressing under him. So I I, def, I don't think there's much to like about Doug Peterson right now. A couple of years ago, obviously, he looked great. But 2017 was 2017. Yeah. This is 2020. Adam Gase so. went to the Super Bowl with Peyton Manning. Yeah, that that, that also happened. So. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's much like with Doug Peterson. I think that's just, you know, a shiny object because of the, you know, the past accomplishments. But right now there isn't anything to like. I think there are too many good up and coming names for the Jets to go for, uh, to go for a guy like Peterson, just because he's, you know, more well-known has the experience, but it does, he's not been doing a good job yeah, this season. And I agree with you. And I think yeah, I see this, this point a lot where people will go, I want somebody with head coaching experience. And for the most part, I mean, just, let's just look at the last Jets head coach that, that, uh, that the Jets hired with head coaching experience, and that would be Adam Gase. I agree with you. I'm not a huge fan of retreads. I feel like for the most part, 
if they've been fired as a head coach, they're probably not going to be great. The second time around, those same issues are going to come up again. And if, and if they are, you preferably want them to take a year or two off to reevaluate themselves. Normally those retreads that are worth hiring are somebody who has had great success. The last two or three years didn't go as well. Give them a year or two, and then they can come back. Those are the really only sort of success stories as far as retreads. I mean, Andy Reid's an outlier, uh, of course, but I agree with you. I don't necessarily look at having been a head coach as a must you know, need. I think being a, you can be a leader and still be an offensive coordinator, or a defensive coordinator. There are born leaders in this league that work with players, uh, you know, interact with players every single day. And those players can attest and, and people in the, the building can attest that this guy is a leader. This guy can be a head coach. So you don't need a guy to, to be a head coach. I have a, a sneaking suspicion because obviously I, I would love Arthur Smith, but I do have kind of this inkling that it, that, and this is the second part of what I was going to bring up that the jets are going to hire a college coach. And I just kind of have that feel. I mean, look, the ownership was really into it between Cliff Kingsbury and Matt rule. They became how close to Matt rule uh, in 2018. Of course it didn't happen, but clearly the Johnsons aren't afraid of hiring a, a college coach. They've been rumored to have loved Jim Harbaugh. That's still a possibility. And I could see Joe Douglas, you know, going with uh, somebody he believes can, you know, we've heard him talk about how much culture means to him and he wants somebody who can, can, can cultivate a culture. And despite what I just said about being able to look at a coordinator who is uh, a great leader and interacts with players and, and that respect him, you can look to a guy who's been a leader of a, of a college program and, and cultivated a culture there. Matt Campbell is a guy who comes to mind uh, and hire that guy expecting the same thing to happen in the NFL. Matt rule as, and Cliff Kingsbury, who have both gone on to other teams and so far so good um, and building their culture Michael, what do you think about that? Do you kind of feel the same way that that the Jets might go to that college route? And if they do, would you be happy? Who are some of the guys that, that you'd be thinking of? Obviously, we're King Arthur. I, I think he's a slam dunk head coaching prospect wherever he ends up. But I, I feel like the Jets may not do what I want them to do. Not that I'm against them hiring a college coach, but obviously I want King Arthur. I have a feeling that the Jets might go another direction, though, that they might go with a college coach. That's just a hunch you know, and at the end of November, it's beginning of December by the time people are listening to this with about five, six weeks to go before we see, start seeing the, the initial interviews. What are your feelings on this? And, and who are some college coaches you'd be intrigued by? I think it definitely is something they could do. Like, like you said, culture seems to be a big priority for Douglas as it should be. It's very important, especially if you're a maybe winless team trying to re turn your organization around. So I could definitely see him going for a college, co a college head coach, you know, who has experience being a head coach, even though, like you said, it's not necessarily a necessity, but it can be an asset, you know, depending on what you're looking for. But I could definitely see him going there. Matt Campbell's the hot name from Iowa State, although I'm not sure if he wants to leave college and come to the NFL. Seems like there are other rumors about him uh, maybe staying in college already. Um, Pat Fitz uh, Fitzgerald was mentioned from Northwestern, but I could definitely see them going that route. Um, and, and, you know, the success that Matt rule and Cliff Kingsbury have had uh, this season definitely paves the way for that to be a route that I think teams will look for more often. And, and of course, you know, rules Panthers aren't necessarily the best team in the league, but I mean, the job he's done has been really impressive. The Panthers had a roster that was, you know, maybe the worst in the league and they've been extremely competitive They're Even though they're four and eight, they've lost a ton of close games against really good teams, barely lost to the saints, the chiefs. Um, they played a lot of close, really good teams really well. They've had the hardest schedule in the league. Um, so the Panthers have looked really respectable. Kingsbury has gone into Arizona and brought a very unique style of offense to the pro level. And it's been successful and he's developed Kyler Murray. So those two guys have definitely come up and really, pave the way I think and then also in Carolina you've Joe Brady at, at the offensive coordinator spot who's you know doing a really good job with Teddy Bridgewater Robbie Anderson managing that offense without Christian McCaffrey so there are a lot of college coaching you know guys coming straight up from the college ranks being successful in the NFL and year after year the, the two sides of the coin come closer and closer the NFL becomes more like college instead of molding the players to the professional in, into the professional sport, they're molding the NFL to be more like college. So it's easier, you know, for players to adapt. So the game, the two sides are becoming a lot closer and success stories like that make it 
a lot. It's going to be a lot, very popular uh, decision. I think teams make the season to look towards the college ranks for not just head coaches, but also coordinator jobs as well. So I could definitely see Douglas going that route. Yeah. I mean, hell it's, it's the same sport. I don't know why people try to act like the college rank is so much different than the NFL. Obviously it's a greater talent pool than the NFL or a higher talent pool, I should say, but it's the same sport. And if you can coach and you can coach well in college, there's a good chance you can coach, not all the time, but there's a good chance you can coach in the NFL. The other name that, you know, I've seen floated around it. I don't know if I'd love this. I'm not a huge fan uh, of his. Um, and I don't, I don't think it would even happen, but look, if the jets were going to land Trevor Lawrence, Maybe Dabo Sweeney leaves Clemson and, and tries to make his jump to the NFL. He knows how good Trevor Lawrence is. That would be an opportunity for him if he really wanted it. But I don't know if I'd, I'd be fully in love with that. I think Matt Campbell right now is the best college coach that the Jets could hire. Uh, I think he will get an interview. Um, I think he will be a serious contender. I think Joe Brady will as well. Um, but a lot of people are saying that the Jets can't attract a good head coaching candidate, but if they have Trevor Lawrence, they're going to get all the top head coaching candidates or at least going to take an interview because the smart head coaching candidates will realize what Joe Douglas has done in his first draft, the number of assets that the Jets have compared to a team like Houston, they might have Deshaun Watson, but they don't have a first round pick that rosters needs a complete teardown. They don't have a GM. They don't have the cap, um, but you could get Trevor Lawrence on a rookie contract with this GM, with the amount of assets that they have, with some of the pieces between Becton and Mims and Quinn and Williams and that New York market, that's an attractive place. The Johnsons, the press, there are some negatives, the, the allure of losing. There are some negatives to the jets, but certainly the idea of, of winning in New York and, and the, the superstar that will make you in addition to all the other things I, I just mentioned has to be attractive to somebody. Um, but Michael, I think that's going to do it for us. Um, I think we covered everything. We will be back next Monday after the Jets hopefully lose to the Raiders. Uh, you can follow us at Cool Your Jets, or excuse me, at CYJ Pod on Twitter. You can find Michael at Michael underscore Nanny on Twitter, myself at Ben W. Blessington. You can listen to this podcast, iTunes, Spotify. You can also find it on JetsXFactor.com. We are also sponsored by Manscaped. Go to Manscaped.com and use the code Cool Your Jets for 20% off and free shipping. Michael, that'll do it for us. Any last uh, thoughts before we end this one? I mean, all I've got to say is that I feel really good right now. There's a lot of talent on this team that is uh, looking really promising, like potential building blocks. And the Jets are fortunate enough to be in this position where they're having this nightmare season with the best possible reward you can ask for. To have the season any other year would be really tough without having Lawrence at the end of the tunnel. But right. with him there, if they can finish this job, you can't ask for a better piece to rebound from potentially 0 and 16. So I'm, I'm, I'm having a lot more fun with this than I should be for an 0 and 11 team, but I, I really like a lot of this roster and there's a light at the end of the tunnel. As I said, every week we get closer, my hope is rising. And so is my anxiety. I'm not going to watch any Trevor Lawrence highlights. I'm not going to, I'm going to try to keep my hope down. I'm not going to try to count my chickens before they hatch. Uh, but certainly it's looking, looking more and more likely that the Jets could steal Trevor Lawrence because who would have thought this would be the, the type of conversations we'd be having um, in December. And look, even if the Jets do steal a win, keep it on that week 16 Jags uh, Chicago Bears game in Jacksonville. I think that's a game that especially if Gardner Minshew's playing and hell the, the Jaguars could win this week again, uh, weekend against the Vikings. But I think that Jags Bears game week 16 is a game that be very important for the Jets whether or not they pick up an extra win that week 17 game against the Patriots certainly scares me um, or they lose out um, I think that could very well decide the Jets fate um, so five weeks five very stressful weeks but certainly the light you get back healthy we're depending yeah, on you we're I will I will buy I know I already said I'd buy a Pierre to see jersey if they lost that game but I will buy a Gardner Minshew jersey as well if they can pick up a win anytime here shortly oh really quickly before we end this very important topic, a grave topic, and, and something I thought I should bring to your attention. Braden Mann leading uh, the NFL, at least in the fan votes, in Pro Bowl voting. I don't know if I agree with that. I, I know that's a, that's a slanderous take to make about Braden Mann. <laughs> I know he's, he's your guy, but I don't know if I think that Braden – I, mean, I think he's been good. I think he will be a really good punter, but I don't – I don't think he's been the best punter in the league so far. What are your thoughts yeah, on that? I, I agree. He definitely hasn't been worth I mean, If you're the Pro Bowl punter, you got to be the best or second best in the league. And I don't think he's been close to that yet, but he's gradually improving and definitely getting there. I think yeah, since he, his first few games, he's probably been average to above average. He's getting better and he brings value 
with the tackling, even the holding that a lot of other punters don't. So very promising rookie season. Punters can progress too. Lachlan and, Edwards did it. And so, he's doing the he's doing the, the kickoffs. Best too. Punter. He's and doing he the kick- kickoffs as yeah. well. So I remember I, he was a kickoff specialist when he first got to Texas AM and then Brent Boyer said that he thought that that messes with your um, kick or your punting motion, but presumably just due to the Jets injuries with Ficken and having Castillo. And then also the fact that he's displayed his abilities as a tackler, something valuable in the kickoff team. I agree. I think he will ultimately be worth that pick. I mean, six round picks, how many of them hit? And I think Braden Mann will be a stud. He's been, he's been solid so far, but best punter in the league. I think that's a little bit of a stretch, but I love to see it though. We're probably going to be well represented at this non-existent pro bowl. With yeah. I think the Madden, and Quinn the Williams. Madden, yeah, Brain man. I think it's going to be the Madden Pro Bowl, but I I, I do yeah. believe that that Mackay and, and Quinnen should both make it. You never know; they're on terrible teams, so maybe they get snubbed. But they certainly deserve it with their performance. Uh, as I said, that'll do it for us. Thank you so much for listening. Go Jets! Five more weeks, and then Trevor Lawrence just keep losing, keep the faith, uh, and then the Jets will Take finally the have their season. The Touchdown, most likely. There goes Gunner to the 40, to the 30, breaks the tackle at the 20, 10, 5. Unbelievable. Touchdown.